Well, I learned something very interesting today. I've been fiddling with the electrical circuit simulator over at falstad.com. F A L S T A D, that's Paul Falstad. And he and he well he developed the Java version of this simulator and then um Ian Sharp um, converted it to JavaScript, which is cool because I don't have Java in installed on my browser. Um, so, instead of just wondering or conjecturing, guessing, and then playing with the pillows to get them just right, um, they don't seem to want to go where I want them to go. Um, it was interesting. Playing with the circuit, I realized that there were surges happening in the circuit. I divided the source power up, so normally when the sine wave inverter uh, has a plug number one and plug number two, but it's one unit, I divided the power source into two separate 60-cycle main, mains power source, 120 volts each. And I only put the spark, and I moved this, um, the neon bulb in the form of a spark gap with the correct parameters over to one of those two power sources. And the one that I did not have it associated with, the, there was a huge drain on that power source. It was like, it was straining. It, and I remember reading that the power company doesn't like it when manufacturing companies use um, inductive loads, very large motors. It puts a strain on the power company um, because there's an extra amount of power, as Jim Murray says, to merely charge up the field coils of the motor. And that energy is not spent. I mean, it's returned back to the power company when the motor shut down, but while it's running, I note, well, while my simulator was running, it, I noticed that there was this huge surge of um, power in the megawatts and the kiloamps, and it was like, and it was always number the number two power source. Um, the one to the left had the spark gap, and that was stayed rock solid throughout. So I realize I have to put the two power sources back together again as one power source somehow so that I can p position only one spark gap right alongside it. Because where I had it before, right by, or where I had it initially, right underneath the capture loop, never developed enough um, volts to light the neon bulb, bulb to spark across the spark gap. Um, and I thought that was peculiar. So I started putting spark caps elsewhere. And I realized where I had it was the worst place to put it. So I figured, well, you know, where is the power? The power seems to be strongest right by the source. So why don't I put it there? And it turns out that when you start monkeying with the thing, especially the power source that feeds the toroids, that one seems to take the biggest hit of surging. And that's the one that needs the um, spark arrestor more than anything. But I remember seeing a diagram in which the spark gap was inside the box from which the power came out to power the load, or power the circuit. And the circuit the, in question was a single toroid version. Well, be that as it may, the spark gap was inside. It wasn't an exterior. So, it, and it wasn't clear the wiring. You know, the wiring diagram inside the box was not clear. Only outside was semi-clear, as it is. So, <clears throat> um, I realized that, first of all, both power outlets have to be in sync. I mean, I have to make sure I do that, maybe with a clock or, or something, or maybe double the voltage, make it 240, and then split it. 
actually I forgot how voltage works. No, voltage, if it's run in parallel, you can split it safely. Only the amperage gets reduced in half, but the voltage stays the same, that's right. So I'm going to have one power source and I'm going to V it, I'm going to branch it into two outlet branches and one goes to feed the toroids and the other goes to feed the other part of the circuit. That way, um, and, and before I branch it, I'm going to put the uh, spark gap calibrated for a neon bulb. I, I, it, it took several hours of web searching to find someone, a reference, asking the question and getting it answered. How do you simulate a neon bulb in these simulators? And it, it turns out there are two different ways. One uses an op amp, um, but you have to have additional power sources inside the circuit to power it. Yet one of those is a 10 volt battery uh, DC power source, and it's turned around in reverse. It's really weird. But that started to make sense because when I looked up neon bulbs on Wikipedia of all people, all sources, they actually admitted they have a whole article devoted to negative resistance and the best way f for me to define it is not in terms of current but in terms of res resistance namely um, see normally the current is derived by dividing resistance into voltage but with a negative resistor it's in it's you, you do the reciprocal of that. They call it negative resistance, but it's not really negative. It's 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 the reciprocal resistance, because um, the resistance is divided by the voltage to give you the amperage. That means that in the old way, if um, the demand, if the load went up, represented by the resistance, the amperage would go down, even though the voltage would stay the same. But with a negative resistor, um, if the demand goes up and the voltage stays the same, the amperage goes up. And they were saying this is what a neon bulb and fluorescent tube, any kind of gas discharge tube, fluorescent bulbs, they do the same thing. They're negative resistors. Well, that means, and in fact, they said that fluorescent bulbs have a ballast. Ballast? to keep them f their amperage internally from rising to infinity and blowing up. Can you believe that? This is what they keep secret from us. I mean, that's admitting over unity right there. Good grief. Without coming out and saying so, meanwhile, they say that, you know, Stanley Meyer is a fraud. Good grief. So, you know, if you look in the right places, you find the truth hiding in plain sight. So, a neon bulb is a over unity device already it's a component gas discharge tube it's a component that not only regulates the surge near the power source to keep it from oh it was like a wild stallion it was going all over the place but it um in a, in and of itself it's a negative resistor so now i know the definition of a negative resistor in terms of taking the reciprocal of Ohm's law, which is very interesting. So I learned where to put the spark gap, and now tomorrow I'll put the two power sources together in one place so that the spark gap can regulate both and keep them from wildly going all over the place. Because I was getting megawatts, kilowatts, mega amps, kiloamps coming from the source, the second source that had no spark gap next to it. But the other uh, source had the spark gap next to it, and it was rock solid. It just stayed put, 120 volts, you know. No problem. It stayed right where I wanted it to be. So it's, it's, it's obvious the surge protector is not for lightning strikes hitting the ground outside. It's for surges that develop in the circuit. And to call it parasitic transients may not be valid. It's... Um, it's some kind of a backwash, so to speak, backlash that goes from the various certain parts of the circuit, I don't know what, back to the power source in the form of um, 
I guess, reactive power. Why else would the power source surge wildly? And it was going all over the place. It was negative watts. Negative? What's a negative watt? You know? Negative amps. I mean, it's like, huh? Does that mean power is being created? And not because of the spark gap, I don't think. I, I could be wrong, but I think because of the toroids, the way they're set up. And the funny thing was, you know, you know, these simulators must be uh, ridiculously limited because I kept changing the polarity on the windings on the toroid, and nothing changed. And I think my multiple, multiple power sources all fire at the same time. There's a common clock in the JavaScript that's syncing all the various power sources to be at the same time. In fact, they had a circuit for having power out of phase, but you have to make it happen. So I think, you know, having two power sources allowed the second one to be unregulated, but the phase, though, was still locked in, I think. I think that's what I'm thinking. Between the two, they were both locked into each other. Anywho, so I didn't really accomplish much except, well, I, this is important actually, is what to do about that darn spark gap, that darn uh, neon bulb. So the other variety of creating a neon bulb simulation has nothing to do with a spark gap, which is fundamentally what's inside the neon bulb is a spark gap, a sparking gap passing through the neon gas. And the use of an op amp was strictly a DC situation in which the power source was non-pulsed. It was continuous DC. Um, and the particular example was to, to turn that continuous DC power into a flashing neon situation in which it periodically, very regularly, um, flashes and creates, flashes over within the spark gap and creates the characteristic curve on the oscilloscope readout for a um, neon bulb. And it's, I was quite impressed, but it's, it's pulsing, you know, it's, I mean, the whole point with the spark gap in the Barbosa and Leal is that it's not strictly regulated when the thing fires. So I'm not sure when it does, when the sparks fire, um, but, you know, anywho, so I can't, I don't think I can use an op amp. I was just, so then I realized if I can't use the op amp, then I just have to reposition the spark gap. I mean, if it, the, I could never get the, the voltage could never go high enough, no matter what I tried to do. It was all in the milli, uh, volt range. If I was lucky, it might be two, two volts or 30 or 50, but never 65, because I, the parameter I got online was not, was was similar to Clarence. The, the breakdown volt or strike voltage was 65 volts. Um, so I set it up with that. Of course, the guy who had that parameter used a 220 kilo ohm resistor by it next to it, not 100 or 102, which is what Clarence uses in his setup. But then he just bought that unit. You know, I don't think it makes too much difference what size resistor you use. Um, I'm not sure why the resistor is there. But, um, I don't know, I just use it because I know I'm supposed to. <laughs> but the, anyway, um, so that's all I accomplished, and I've been spending a lot of time. But at least I figured out how to to create the component of a spark gap within a, si a simulator. And now I think I know where to put it, and I have to put the two power sources together. Now whether or not I have put a clock timer on them or not to keep them in phase, I don't know. Um, that's about it. That's all I managed to accomplish. It was a lot of work. But at least I'm making a lot of headway. I mean, a simulator, my God, it cuts down on time, and it's so much easier because you see an oscilloscope readout of whatever component you want, other than a transformer. There's no um, oscilloscope readout, but, I guess because there's no waveform, <laughs> singular waveform, but you can get all the other parameters in numeric form, in digital, you know, 
you know, how many volts, how many amps. And since it varies so quickly, what I learned to do is turn on the simulator or let it run a little bit and then turn it off and see where it freezes and then read out, read the different values that were frozen in place. Um, that usually works pretty good. Anywho, um, so it's, and then um, Eon Sharp, his uh, website is lushprojects.com, I believe. And they both have the same simulator, although the source code that they have at GitHub is not the same. And I haven't looked at it more closely, but it's different quantity of files and different overall size. But that's for hosting on your own web server. It's very, I tried, you know, saving the page to my uh, hard drive, to my computer, and then launching it from there, and it just doesn't work. And I tried monkeying with it, and it still didn't work. So it's, it's obvious it has to be served from a server, the page itself that embodies or um, contains this um, simulator in JavaScript code. But once you load it into your browser, then you can run it in your browser, and it doesn't interact with the Internet at all. You could cut yourself off from the Internet, and it would work. You, you just have to load it first from a server. So I guess if you had a server on your home computer, you could serve it to yourself, set it up, compile it. Because it is written in Java, and then you have to compile it to, uh, to be served by the server to uh, run in the, in the user's um, browser in JavaScript. It uses various scripts, uh, PHP scripts, and, on the server side to deliver the... Uh, the simulator into the person's browser. So, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, I'm not going to bother looking at that. I'm spending too much time on the circuit. You know, the neon bulb is a big deal. I mean, and trying to figure out how I'm going to emulate earth ground without using the earth, because, you know, these simulators, I wouldn't know how to emulate the earth. Although the geologic survey um, does give some hints but um, I'd have to look. I haven't looked yet for Earth, geologic Earth uh, survey uh, simulators. Um, I'm sure they exist, but um, <laughs> whether or not they're free is another matter. So I don't know. I still have other, obviously a lot of stuff to do as well as to tidy things up, like the capture loop. How do I simulate a capture loop? because it's not a transformer, it's a loop of wire, which is a inductor, but the, it's not an air core, nor is it an iron core, it's a wire core, <laughs> literally wrapped around a, one of the wires of the circuit. So it's like, huh? How do I deal with this? So, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure I'll figure something out maybe, but I don't know. Anywho, it's very fascinating. Just thought I'd give you an update.